Welcome to Breast Friends Cancer Support Radio. Your hosts are Becky Olson and Sharon Hennepin. Our show is here to help breast cancer patients, survivors, their friends and family with the resources, support, and inspiration they can use right now. Here are your hosts, Sharon and Becky. Welcome to Breast Friends Cancer Support Radio. I'm Sharon Hennepin. I'm a 25-year breast cancer survivor, certified life coach, and the author of my book, Thriving Beyond Cancer. And my name is Becky Olson. I'm a multi-time, five-time actually, um, year survivor of advanced stage breast cancer. I'm also a motivational speaker and the author of The Hat That Saved My Life. Sharon and I are also the co-founders of Breast Friends. And for the listeners who have known me for a long time through this radio show. Some of you do know that um, just recently I was diagnosed with my fifth battle. And um, it's it's been kind of intense because, uh, you know, there's a lot of things happening and we're considering a trial and there's just a lot of stuff going on in my life. And and I had, um, we had our open house the other day at the Breast Friends office. And I had a moment with our guest who's going to be with us here in just a couple minutes. And she just she's such a tender wonderful heart she walked up to me she knew th- about my journey and she asked me how i was coping and i told her that i was you know doing okay most of the time but i was kind of i think the thing that bothered me the most is i felt like i was just sitting around doing nothing and she looked at me and she said becky when you stay in the light, you're not doing nothing. That's that's not doing nothing. Now, I could take a moment and explain what all that means, but I think rather than do that, I think we'll let it come out as our as our guest is chatting because that moment was one of those things that kind of goes down in the in the back of your brain as something that you want to hang on to and remember because it was very powerful. So Sharon, with that, why don't you take a minute here and just go ahead and introduce our guest. I'd love to do that. Um, so that w- um, with that, our guest is someone we've known for quite a while. Um, she was a guest on our show in 2016. She did an interview about taming the fear of recurrence. And she's been a guest presenter at our Survivor Luncheon and is a great resource for the cancer community here in the Portland metro area. So Dr. Shawnee Fox is a naturopath physician, certified life coach, and creator of the leading, excuse me, the leading edge back in charge. It's a medical model for survivor care. Uh, Dr. Shawnee is also the author of the Cancer Survivors Fear First Aid Kit. Oh, boy, we all need that. (laughs) And a popular national speaker, radio guest, and blogger for the Huffington Post and Cancer uh, Survivor Community. So welcome, Dr. Shawnee. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. Well, Well, we're excited to have you. Yes, we definitely are. So why don't you just share a little bit about yourself with our audience, like your, you know, family and hobbies, and that's so we can kind of get to know you a little bit. My family and my hobbies, okay. <laughs> I am the very proud mother of two adult daughters and uh, two little granddaughters who, by the end of November, will have turned three and one. <laughs> oh, fun. Um, yeah, yeah, it's lots of fun. Um, I made a very significant midlife career change to become a naturopathic physician. Before that, believe it or not, I was an accountant, a CPA. Oh, wow. So what? I developed all Who parts of that? my brain. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. Yeah. And what, what possessed yeah. you to go from an accountant to a naturopathic physician? You know, I was working in the corporate world, and I had a very fine position uh, in many ways. You know, it compensated me well. They really liked me there. But I got to a certain point in my career that I realized that to go further, I'd need a graduate degree in business, and I just didn't have the heart to do it. And I said, Mm -hmm. something's wrong with this picture. So Mm -hmm. at that point, I did some um, reflecting and soul-searching and said, you know, what is it I really want to do when I grow up? (laughs) And so I, I realized that what was missing, what was missing for my life is that I really wanted to get back to working with people directly. You know, even though I was in a very honorable profession, it wasn't what my heart wanted to do. And so as I explored that, I realized I wanted to go into medicine, which, by the way, was not new. I, I had wanted, I had been an undergraduate pre-med and given that up for reasons that no longer were applicable. So I was really coming full circle to something that I'd always loved. Wow, that's great that you listen to your heart. I know one one mm. thing I always tell my daughter is um, 
is, uh, you know, the ladder of success, right? And you climb the ladder of success. Mm -hmm. And then when you get to the top, you realize your ladder is leaning against the wrong building. (laughs) Right? (laughs) I love that. That's a great picture. Yeah. I I do too. (laughs) and, And it's one of those things where, yeah, you know, as you're, Getting, uh, making the strides up that ladder, you got to make sure that it is really where you want to be. Because if you get to the top and you realize that, it's like, whoo, whoops. <laughs> that kind of sounds yeah. like our story at, at Yellow Pages, Sharon. Yeah, <laughs> totally. totally. Trying so hard to climb that ladder. Yeah. And then I have realized that at some point, too, and kind of walked out on my job one day. Not the best idea, by the way, folks. No, Don't no. But you, you, were, you were kind of done. So, yeah. I mean... It, it was appropriate for your circumstances. So tell me what area of patient care do you focus on? And, and is it specifically targeted to breast cancer patients? So I went back to school. Uh, the upshot of all that journey was that I went back to uh, school and realized that after a lifetime of, uh, you know, I recognized in my lifetime that I had become aligned with the philosophy of natural medicine. In other words, I really am a great believer in the wisdom of the human body and that the human body will heal itself if it's properly supported. And it's not our job to suppress it uh, in general, that it really knows what it's doing and will make us well if it's given, if, if, if it's well supported. So that aligned me with naturopathic medicine and that is the medical school I chose to go to. Once I graduated uh, I realized that the tools of naturopathic medicine, which are, this is lifestyle as medicine. This is knowing how to get optimal sleep. This is knowing how to eat optimally. This is knowing how to move your body optimally. And then using as support for all that, herbs and uh, various other natural therapeutics, such that the body is able to do its job on it in the way that it was designed to do. I recognized that coming out of school and starting my practice that the, this particular toolkit was ideally matched for the needs of cancer survivors who are mm. at that point, at least hopefully, not, you know, they don't have a diagnosed disease. I mean, they, they could be living with cancer, but in many cases, they don't even have something that's called a diagnosis anymore, right? They're in remission, yet they're not well. They're not fully well. You know, treatment, as we all know, is, is, can be brutal, and it leaves all sorts of effects on the body. And so the, the journey at that point is to, be, to return to a, a rich and well life. And naturopathic medicine is, is ideal to support that. So that's when I began to practice and focus my practice on cancer survivors um, and patients who are going to become survivors shortly. You know, in other words, like supporting people through the, the throes of treatment and then into their lives beyond that. Okay, well, that's quick quite, question, Shawnee. Yeah. Let me just ask you a quick question on that. So, do you um, mm-hmm. work with patients like from that moment of diagnosis, or is it more when they've started treatment? Typically, they'll find me later on in the journey, only because that moment of diagnosis, especially a first diagnosis, is such a shock that yeah. you know people. It's, it's all people can do to handle what's handed to them on a plate, which is, you know, okay, here's your plan, here's when you're going to show up, and et cetera. There's so much going yeah. on for an initially diagnosed person that they so may not true. think about naturopathic medicine immediately. They will think about us typically uh, when they're in the middle of treatment and perhaps side effects are starting to set in uh, okay. or they notice that they simply cannot function at, at their usual level and they're having, you know, they want to help adjusting to that. Right, right. That makes complete sense. So, so again, mm-hmm. that person who has gone through uh, treatment, you know, feeling some of those side effects, um, wanting to eliminate or reduce those. That makes perfectly mm-hmm. good sense why you would, you know, uh, reach out to a naturopath at that time. Yeah, that makes perfectly good sense. So um, talk about um, your areas of expertise, if you don't mind. I know you mentioned you're, you know, a, a speaker and, you know, all, you're doing all sorts of stuff these days. Well, yeah, I, I I do speak, I do workshops, I uh, do one-on-one uh, mentorship and coaching, um, all of that around this theme of cancer is not just about a tumor, it's about a whole person having a very significant experience. And so if we think about the conventional system, it's very tumor-focused, and of course that's very important, we need that, um, but mm-hmm. it will often lose sight of the whole person, which is why 
you know, it doesn't have an awful lot to offer, for example, with some of these side effects, you know, naturopathic medicine does. And then certainly once the treatment journey is over, uh, you know, there's this tendency to think, oh, well, you're done in the conventional right. system. <laughs> well, you're done with, yeah, well, you're done with that phase, but anybody who's been through this knows we are certainly not done at that point. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, there's yeah, so there's much, so in, much recovery, more. Recovery, for mm-hmm. example, mm-hmm. yeah, and that's part of what I, what I focus on as well, recovery and, I, and, and re- readjustment to life. I love Let me that. ask you a quick question again. I, I well, it may not be quick, but you know, there was a time probably, Shawnee, that um, doctors, MDs, maybe weren't as supportive, you know, for having patients cross over into a different area, like working with nature paths. But now there's all this um, integrative medicine concepts where it's becoming more kind of the standard. Any, it seems like anymore. Are you finding that things have changed in your world as far as acceptance goes? From the medical community, They're changing for sure, yeah, and and you know we all know that doctors, well, many doctors kind of live and die by research trials, and mm-hmm. so for a while they were all saying, you know, well, there's no research to support this. Well, they can no longer say that. The research, uh, the, the the accumulation of research behind natural therapeutics, both on their own and in combination with uh, conventional therapy, is beginning mm-hmm. to be. A tide that nobody can ignore. There, there are so many uh, strong trials supporting certain natural therapeutics for helping the conventional therapeutics do their job, and then you know also on their own later again in recovery that people people have less fatigue, for example, as survivors or uh, less anxiety. You know, there, it, this is not it's not possible to ignore this anymore. So any doctor who's up on their research will now know that this is the future direction of medicine that we all work together. And that well, makes sense. Yeah. yeah, and I'm glad to see it. I mean, I know some of the big cancer centers now have integrative medicine departments, you know, that are headed mm-hmm. by by physicians who do what you do. So, yeah, it's it's a change mm-hmm. that I think was was slow to come, but does seem to be switching around. I just wasn't sure if you started back in the when it was slow to come <laughs> process, <laughs> or if it's always been kind of more accepted by the time you started. Well, and it it makes complete sense, too, when you think about, um, again, I'm not a doctor, but but it seems as if that our immune systems are compromised. And so part of at least my thinking around naturopathic medicine is to boost your immune system. So, again, you're you're working from um, an inside out perspective to mm-hmm. uh, strengthen that immune system so your body can fight the cancer better. It can make uh, a better surrounding for the the actual uh, Western medicine to take hold and to, you know what I mean? It just, mm-hmm. it makes complete sense. Um, unfortunately, it, again, it, it it's not necessarily the first line of defense that a lot of people um, think about. So, but to integrating it together, I think is amazing. It, it is. And, you know, immune system is one aspect of it, a very important one, of course, you know, but there are others, for example, uh, you know, the digestive system, of course, can be hit very hard, let's say, by many chemotherapies. And right. if the digestive system isn't working, then even if you're eating an excellent diet or trying to, because you may not be able to eat as much or as well as you used to, um, but even if you are getting good nourishment, if your digestive system isn't properly absorbing it, then none of the systems in your body will work optimally, including your di- immune system. So that oh, digestive system, even though we don't normally you know, tie that together with this picture, it's essential because a person becomes malnourished without, without proper nutrients to uh, get them through a time when they need extra nutrients, you know, for the body to handle metabolized chemotherapy agents, it it requires enormous amounts of nutrients. And many chemotherapy patients, for example, aren't getting that because they can't eat properly. And even when they eat, they are not absorbing properly. So this is all, again, the domain of naturopathic medicine that it just doesn't even enter the mind generally of the conventional system. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Talk that about sleep. Talk about sleep for a minute because you mentioned earlier on oh, yeah. you know, a few minutes ago about the importance of sleep and and why is that so important? I mean, I think we kind of intellectually know, at least those of us who have been mm-hmm. through this enough times, but why don't you speak mm-hmm. to our listeners to kind of understand the importance of sleep and what do you do if you can't sleep? You know, it's hard sometimes to just fall asleep without taking something you know, some kind of chemical. So talk about that for a moment. Sure. So sleep 
in addition to just feeling rested, we, we have to keep in mind that overnight and, and when we sleep, this is when our body repairs itself. So just in the course of normal functioning during the day, even before we talk about cancer treatment, um, you know, we, we use up a lot of energy and our, our organs are working very hard, including our brain especially. You know, it's thinking all day long whether we want it to or not. You know, our hearts are working, our lungs are working, everything's working, and this takes, you know, the, the organs are working very hard. So we need that overnight period of restoration for any wear and tear on the muscles and the organs to be repaired. That's, that's when our body does that. We go into this low-key mode uh, so that those repair systems can work. If, those, if we're not getting enough sleep, then we're not getting our organs and tissues sufficiently repaired. And over time, of course, that results in degradation. When you combine that with the wear and tear that happens through cancer treatment, which, of course, is, is extreme compared to everyday life, then sleep becomes even more essential. And it's really not surprising, for example, that our body wants to sleep more often during what treatment is going on. You know, we, we find ourselves sleeping more. Uh, otherwise, we feel fatigued. You know, that, that, that fatigue is our body saying, please, let me rest. Um, so, so we really, really need it. That, that's where the need comes from, is this need for repair, which is heightened during cancer treatment. Mm-hmm. As far as that makes <laughs> what do you do sense, if you can't yeah. sleep? Well, yeah, that, so that, that, that's a puzzle. That, that's something that a naturopathic physician can help you figure out. You know, the question is, why aren't you sleeping? Well, um, let me just say, first of all, that anybody who's on steroids or has steroids as part of the treatment, steroids doesn't want to, they don't want to sleep. So that's going to be one piece of it. But that makes it extra important that when the steroids have left your body that you do get the extra rest. And if at that point you can't sleep, it may be anxiety, it may be um, something, that, you know, your hormonal balance. And by that, I mean the ones that may be off, and it frequently is during cancer treatment. So there's lots of possible causes that a person couldn't sleep, and, and a naturopathic physician will help tease those causes out and treat whatever the cause is. You know, we're having some technical difficulties right now, Shawnee, hearing you because the, the sound is getting a little bit garbled. So we're going to go out to break and see if our genius engineer, Aaron, can help us figure out what's going on. So, Aaron, I hope you're listening, right. but we're going to go ahead and take a break now. Um, we'll be back in a minute. Thanks. Become our friend on Facebook. Post your thoughts about our shows and network on our timeline. Visit Facebook.com forward slash Voice America. Thank you for listening today. Breast Friends needs your support. We rely on donations to keep our doors open and to keep this radio program alive. Please consider making a tax-deductible donation to Breast Friends. You can visit us at breastfriends.org. You can also like us on Facebook at Breast Friends of Oregon. Be sure to tune in to the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel every Wednesday at 9 a.m. Pacific Time and Thursdays at 9 a.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Women's Channel for Breast Friends Cancer Support Radio. Visit breastfriends.org and contribute today. When was the last time you felt free? It's time to uncover that feeling again with the compassion of a cross and shield and the power of a card that opens doors to the best hospitals and medical centers in all 50 states. Giving you the freedom to love, to dream, to dance like no one is watching. Regions Blue Cross Blue Shield. Live fearless. Have you friended us on Facebook yet? Why not? Just go to Facebook.com forward slash Voice America or search for the keywords Voice America. Once you are part of our Facebook network, you'll receive daily messages about what's happening with our shows, this week's featured guests, and new happenings at the Voice America Talk Radio Network. And you can add your voice to the always active discussions on our timeline. Just go to Facebook.com forward slash Voice America or search for Voice America. You are tuned in to Breast Friends Cancer Support Radio. To reach the program today, please call us at 1-866-472-5792. Again, that's 1-866-472-5792. You may also send an email to becky at breastfriends.org. Now, back to the show. 
Welcome back to our program. We've been talking to our guest, Dr. Shawnee Fox. So, Shawnee, because of that technical difficulty, let's go back to that sleep thing. I want to make sure that the audience really um, heard all of that piece, that last little bit. So, as far as the sleep is concerned and repairing your body and all of that, I think that's a huge piece. And I think you were actually giving us some, some tips as far as what do we do with that um, do, can you kind of repeat that a little bit for us, please? Sure. What I was concluding with there is that if a person can't sleep, there could be numerous reasons for that. Just because, you know, again, cancer treatment can, can cause all kinds of jumbling in, in, in the way the body works. And so we want to just see if we can suss out the reason that the person's not sleeping. For some people, it'll be anxiety. And anxiety may be part of their thoughts. It may be encouraged by uh, some upset in the way their body's working as well. So we have to look at both physical and emotional sides of that. Um, or it could be, you know, also cancer treatment can upset a person's hormones. And so mm, hormones definitely. have a lot to do with our <laughs> sleep cycle as well. And, and mm-hmm. so we want to correct that. Okay. Okay. So there, Let me ask there at okay. least are some things to do, which is nice because when you're feeling mm-hmm. like you're awake at three o'clock in the morning and you can't go back to sleep and it becomes a habit or a pattern, yeah, it y- mm-hmm. you need something to be able to give you some hope that this is going to change. So that makes sense. Yeah, Becky, that, sorry. Yeah, wh- that's okay. One more question on that. So I know a lot of people, myself included, when I struggle with sleep, I, you know, you lay in bed for a while and you think you're going to doze off, but you just don't. And if you got up and took some kind of a, a chemical sleep aid, like a uh, one of these PM aspirin related, you know, Tylenol kind of PM things, or um, some kind of a, a drug that might have been given to you by your doctor to help sleep, is that can that also be restorative sleep, or is that the chemical going to block the repair that's supposed to happen in your body? Well, if you get along with the chemical, <laughs> in other words, yeah. if it doesn't cause side effects. Then I, you know, I view these as temporary tools, but sometimes necessary right. tools. I mean, if a person okay. really just isn't sleeping, the fact is that sleep is really critical to the process of uh, getting through and then recovering from treatment. So it has to happen. Okay. We want it to happen. Okay. And if the only okay. way we can get a person to sleep is through some temporary um, over-the-counter, let's say, pharmaceutical assistance, right. then right. That's, not out of, that's not off the table. It, it's more important okay. that they sleep. You know, I'd rather use natural tools myself, but if, if, if that's just not happening for any reason, uh, it's okay. really that important that a person sleep and using those that temporarily yeah. is fine. Yeah. Good. Thank sense. you. I just wanted yeah. to kind of clear that up because every time I do that, it's like, oh, should I, is this, is this going to help? Or, you know, I mean, I know I'll mm-hmm. sleep, but am, am I going to miss the point? But what you're saying is sleep is sleep. You get there, you get there somehow, some way. Right, and right, right. So, okay. Thank you. I just wanted to clear up that little mystery for me mm-hmm. so I can do that guilt free <laughs> on occasion. <laughs> so, right, right. Exactly. Thank you. And, and let's go back to your expertise, because, again, we mentioned the fact that you're, you know, doing a lot of presentations and workshops and things like that. But I'm curious about the whole Huffington Post and being a writer and all that. That's pretty exciting since I just finished my book, you know, this year myself. Mm-hmm. Yes, I know what a process that is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's awesome, Sharon, that your book is out now. Um. I have been maintaining a blog for a long time. And oh, okay. what I, you know, as I work with more and more survivors, what I recognized is that there are a lot of questions that they have that are not answered within, within their conventional cancer team, or sometimes they're afraid to articulate it. Um, or even if they do, occasionally it's just not, it's not received and acknowledged. And a perfect example of this is the fear, you know, the fear that people have. They, they, they can be through with their cancer treatment. Their numbers are great. Everything looks great. So for all, to all intents and purposes, everybody will say, you're well. You're well now. And, and they are at the physical level. And they still can have intense fear about the cancer might come back or other fears. Right. And, and, they'll, and they'll approach their team with this fear, you know, and, and people at times will come back and say, well, why should you be afraid? You had the best treatment. It's over. <laughs> it's like You're cancer free now. Not, why? Why are you worrying? Right? <laughs> why would you exactly? Why would you be afraid now? And and the fa- the fear is very very real to the patient or survivor. Yes. And so it's 
like a rebuff that the system, the person they're talking to is not acknowledging what their, their, their very valid experience. So there are experiences like this along the way, particularly at the emotional level, that I recognize were not being adequately addressed within the process, the usual process of cancer treatment and beyond. And I wanted to give voice to some of that, help, help people, first of all, cancer patients realize that, first of all, this is valid. This is absolutely valid. In fact, research now shows that at least 70, uh, 70% of cancer survivors struggle with persistent fear about yeah. recurrence or, or you know, progression if, if you're living with cancer. That's the convincing majority. That's probably the most common side effect of cancer, if you think about it. Yeah. And yet, this yeah. is not being acknowledged within the system. So I wanted to give people a voice. And I have a affinity for writing. I, I, I like writing. And, it, you know, people seem to be um, touched sometimes by my writing. So I started a blog. And then I said, well, it would be nice if more people, you know, there's so many millions of people out there experiencing this. It would be nice if more people could see this. So I applied and got accepted as a blogger for the Huffington Post. And, and the, the posts that I would write there are about these emotional experiences and validating those. Mm-hmm. You know, that's that. a that's a real kudo on your part because, you know, I, I actually tried to do that as well and I got rejected. Oh. <laughs> well, not really rejected. They just never got back to me. <laughs> so I guess that's kind of oh. like, don't call us, we'll call you kind of thing. Right. But, um, mm. but, you know, I guess you have to have the the right the right combination of things to do that and you know I consider myself a pretty good writer and a lot of other people do as well but but there's something real mm-hmm. special in what you're doing Shawnee to have well, gotten and because accepted. of her her credentials I'm yeah. sure that makes a difference as yeah. well being a naturopathic physician and and all of that I'm sure that makes a big big difference too but but the fact that you you know knew in your gut that you needed to do that and you move forward and you did it and even if you were rejected you know you did it which is yeah. a, a you know that's that's what i love to see too you know <laughs> yep that's true mm-hmm. that's true well um i i think it's probably time to kind of shift gears here a little bit so so shawnee um you know we had that special moment um and i mm-hmm. i just kind of curious about how I know I'm jumping into Sharon's part, but sorry, Sharon. That's okay. That's all right. I'm fine. This this was actually your experience, so it yes, makes perfectly it, good sense. It was. So um, but when you walked up to me, you know, I guess I'm I'm kind of curious first off what prompted you to come up and you just asked me how I'm coping. What what prompted you to do that? because you know, you're so sensitive well, and I just want to know what 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 caused that. Yeah, well, you know, I, I um I don't participate in Facebook an awful lot myself, but I do sometimes follow and just check what's going on. And, and Breast Friends and you, Becky, you, you know, you're on my feeds. And I, so I, I knew about what you were going through. And, um, you know, I, nothing I could say on Facebook is the same as, as something I could say in person. So right. I, I had the opportunity and I made a point to go up to you. And I, I remember saying, you know, I want to give you a hug because I can't do that through Facebook. Right. <laughs> right so right. that was the first thing. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's true. And then we got into our conversation. Yeah. And, you know, it was, it was very, it was a very sweet moment. And you, I remember you asking me how I was coping with all of this. And, and I, and I told you about how I, the, the not doing something and the, the reason for that, I guess, and, and again, I don't wait well. I've never waited well. You know, it's this, mm-hmm. this waiting game that, but for me, and part of my lack of sleep is I lie in bed at night and I picture this cancer just, you know, kind of growing on the side and expanding and, you know, because just to give a little a little bit of history there, you know, as, as you all know, I was a four-time survivor and my fourth time was last September a year ago. And we went through a process and we did radiation and they put me on a short-term um, dose of, of a new drug that's all over the TV right now. Um, and, and then in January, we did a scan and it seemed to have cleared up. So the kind of decision was made that we shouldn't maybe be on that drug anymore since maybe it wasn't actually metastatic cancer, just a, a stubborn spot that kind of keep kept coming back. And so we took, I went off the drug and the, the goal or the idea was to just keep monitoring what was going on. So the scan in January was clean. The scan in May was clean. I'm thinking I'm good to go. And then come October for my next scan, just to make sure I'm still good. That's when all these spots popped up. And so that kind of, to me, it felt like it just went from zero to 
five spots in five months from that May scan to currently. Um, but we've kind of figured out since then it was probably metastatic the whole time. We just didn't see it. It was too small. And But what I, was, what I picture there is if it went from zero to five spots in five months, it's been over a month now since that, that scan, and I haven't changed. I'm not doing anything different <laughs> yet. We're, we're working on it, but I'm not doing anything different yet. And so laying there, I'm thinking is... Are the five spots bigger now or are there eight spots now or, you know, and I just would internalize this and it was kind of, I mean, it was causing me to lose sleep and, and it was awful. And when I told you that I felt the cancer was growing out of control and I'm doing nothing. And then you said to me, Becky, staying in the light is not doing nothing. And you reframed it. You even used the word, let me reframe this for you. And and of course, I'm always open to new ideas. Um, so staying in the light is not doing nothing. So what do you mean by that? I mean, you told me that night, but I want our listeners to hear it from you. What does staying in the light mean? And I hope your phone doesn't garble. And if it does, I'm going to stop you. So we <laughs> want to make sure. This is a really Absolutely. big part of this message. So I want you to share with our listeners what you shared with me because it was powerful. We... So you mentioned waiting, and you know, you're waiting for the next piece of conventional treatment to start, and that's how we tend to think of doing something. Whether, you know, if we're in treatment, we're doing something, and if we're not in treatment, we're not doing anything. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to r- remind you that treatment is not the only thing that counts. Treatment is important, and it's not the only thing. The way we live our lives has everything to do with how well we are and how well we can get. And so I pointed out to you in that moment, I said, Becky, look at the way you're living your life. You're speaking, you're singing with your swing orchestra. You you walk around inspiring people on a daily basis. You're living from your heart and your soul. And even though this is new frontier of science to us to really examine why this is the case, that how we live our lives, the quality of our lives, and the, our engagement with life, you know, why that works, you don't know. But it does. It has a lot to do with the, certainly the quality of our life and even the length of our life. And I wanted you to see that, that your life is so radiant that you are oh. living well, even though your treatment hasn't started yet. Mm-hmm. Very, very well put. Thank you for doing that. Because again, sometimes we can obsess. I mean, we can like worry ourselves into a really um, dark place. And so that staying in the light kind of concept, I guess, feels really good. It makes me feel lighter. And, and hopefully that does the same thing for Becky. Well, I have to admit, when you said that to me that night, and I, I mean, I think I, if I remember right, I was crying then because I'm crying now, so I must have been. <laughs> I do cry a lot. But um, it did mean something to me because, I, you know, October was my busiest speaking month, and I knew mm-hmm. that this was going down that pretty much the whole time. The first one I didn't know, but the um, because that was like right at the beginning of October, and my scan wasn't until like the fourth, I think. So, so the first one I didn't know, but the th- other, the three other ones that I did, four other ones actually, um, I knew. And but I don't know. I just when I got up in front of these people and started talking to them, I did share what was going on with with all of them. I just you know my life is an open book, and I did share with them, mm-hmm. but but not to scare anyone, but to try to encourage and give hope and and I guess show that by doing what you love it's you know I kind of see the opposite of of staying in the light is when you're not staying in the light and to me that means laying on my couch and waiting to die and I I can't do that you know I can't that's not that's not who I am and it makes me sad because we've met women sadly who um, you know once they kind of get that metastatic diagnosis and you know, maybe the doctor shares with them what, what that means. And by the way, I told my doctor right up front, <laughs> I said, I never want to hear those words out of your mouth that I only have X, Y, Z amount of time left to live. I never want to hear that because no one knows. And he agreed. He goes, yeah, who, why would I ever do that? No one does know. But there are doctors who will do that. And, yeah, I, yeah, I always say that we don't have an expiration date stamped on the bottom right. of our foot. <laughs> That's right. And, um, and you know, but once you get that, that 
that sentence, I guess, you know, you've got three to six months, a lot of people will live three to six months and somewhere in that time frame, Mm -hmm. they will, they'll give into it. And usually it's kind of early on, they just give in and they just wait. Mm -hmm. And I can't do that. And I just, if there, if our listeners get nothing out of this today, except that statement, keep doing what you love, right? Just do what you love. Even if it's, you know, me it not being being on a stage is not what most people love. <laughs> so, you know, mm-hmm. I'm not saying you have to be like that. But if you love, you know, Sharon loves photography. So if you love photography and you've always done that, go do that. Do whatever it is that you love. Because when you're doing that, and Shawnee, you explained that to me that, you know, it provides, I don't know what the words were, but it, how it builds your not only your your spirit and your mind, but it also has some kind of physical reaction on your cells. Can you explain mm-hmm. that? We've got we've got about three minutes left or so. Um, so why don't you explain it, yeah. that? Sure. You know, what briefly, it, when we are, let's say, in fear or dread, uh, our body produces a certain set of hormones. And when we are happy and alive and engaged with something that we love, we produce a very different set of hormones. And so, the, as you can imagine... The fear-related hormones degrade our cells over time. The happy hormones, if you will, uh, encourage our cells to do what they love, to, to, to function optimally. So we want to stay as much as we can in, in the, on, on the happier side and, and not on the fear side, which only undermines our, uh, our efforts to get well. So there, there are actually physical effects of this, too, our cells getting the message, I'm happy you know, um, we're all alive, we're all in this together, you know, let, let's be well and, and let's live some more. You know, that, that's a very different message. In our, there are literally physical effects of this. I love that. And I just wrote down happy hormones. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, yeah. I don't really know what they are, but I love that term. So I'm going to have to adopt that. And of course, I will give you credit. <laughs> well, and I think it was the, hap- the happiness advantage um, that I read, gosh, a couple years ago. So I'm paraphrasing this from memory. But but it, what, it, what it did is this researcher actually had a group of excuse the expression, negative Nellies in one room and a group of positive Pollies in the next room. And if your name is Nellie or Polly, you know, I'm sorry, but. <laughs> I know. I always but, talk about my husband marrying Brittany, but there is no Brittany in my yeah. life. <laughs> Sorry, guys. (laughs) So this is just an example, but that literally this both groups were given exactly the same assignment. They were giving a given like a forty some page newspaper to look through and count the number of ads, and then as soon as they were done with that, they could leave. And they would get their little certificate or whatever, you know, that they participated in the study. Um, The Negative Nelly group got to the end and went home and it was fine, you know, whatever. But the po- the positive poly group actually saw an ad that was about three quarters through the newspaper. And it said there are, I don't remember how many ads it was, but, you know, 46 ads in this newspaper. You can go home now and collect your $100 gift certificate. So Hmm. what was fascinating to me was the Negative Nelly um, group, most all of them did not see that ad. And over Hmm. 80% of the positive group did see that ad. So, so it's it kind of just almost, goes to show what you look for. You find exactly. what you're looking for. You, yeah. And and if you're mm-hmm. looking for something positive, it's like that little black cloud that sometimes hangs over that person we know, right? Mm-hmm. Um, they mm-hmm. don't even see the possibilities that luckily I'm a positive poly. Um <laughs> If you didn't notice that, Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. that we actually do see and we seek out. And so it, it really framed it in a way that made, made that make more sense. And so that comment, well, just have a positive attitude. Obviously that's (laughs) a lot harder than it sounds, but, but there is 
reasons that we want to work toward that. Yeah. And Sharon, let me just add to that real quickly. I know we need to go out to break, so we will in just a minute. But um, one of the things that I, that I share with my audiences when I speak is it is hard to have a positive attitude when you're feeling pretty gloomy and doomy about things. I mean, it's like, yeah, fine. Okay, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll go get a positive attitude. Right, but right, the, right. But the way you do that is by positive actions. Exactly. And, you know, it's not... It's not something that's just going to be dumped on you. You have to go find that positive action. But sometimes it's as simple as getting your butt off the couch and go take a shower and get dressed. That's a positive action. And that little thing, that little activity right there will break that momentum of that gloom and doom that you're that you're just laying in, you know. Um, right. So just that or positive action. go for a action. walk. Or, yeah, yeah, you know, get your shoes on and mm-hmm. go outside and enjoy the, the, the beautiful leaves. And, you know, I mean, it, it, it all starts with an action to get to that positive attitude. You can't, it doesn't just bestow itself upon you. You have to, I kind of consider you have to earn it, you know, and, mm-hmm. and you earn it. Mm-hmm. And it's not that hard to earn. You just have to do some positive activity, something minor as it is, as long as it's active and, you know, it's non-passive. And do that, and then pretty soon your your spirits will improve, your attitude will improve, and and that's that's how we kind of make ourselves go there. So um, we're going to go out to break, and we'll pick up more of this conversation on the other side. So stay tuned. We'll be back in a minute. Become our friend on Facebook. Post your thoughts about our shows and network on our timeline. Visit Facebook.com forward slash Voice America. Thank you for listening today. Breast Friends needs your support. We rely on donations to keep our doors open and to keep this radio program alive. Please consider making a tax-deductible donation to Breast Friends. You can visit us at breastfriends.org. You can also like us on Facebook at Breast Friends of Oregon. Be sure to tune in to the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel every Wednesday at 9 a.m. Pacific Time and Thursdays at 9 a.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Women's Channel. For Breast Friends Cancer Support Radio, visit breastfriends.org and contribute today. When was the last time you felt free? It's time to uncover that feeling again with the compassion of a cross and shield and the power of a card that opens doors to the best hospitals and medical centers in all 50 states. Giving you the freedom to love, to dream, to dance like no one is watching. Regions Blue Cross Blue Shield. Live fearless. You are tuned in to Breast Friends Cancer Support Radio. To reach the program today, please call us at 1-866-472-5792. Again, that's 1-866-472-5792. You may also send an email to becky at breastfriends.org. Now, back to the show. Welcome back to our show. We've been talking about the importance of staying in the light with our guest, Dr. Shawnee Fox. So, golly, you know, just like slapping a positive attitude on you, right? <laughs> how do we stay? <laughs> how do we stay in the light? Or if we if we recognize we're not in the light, how do we walk into the light? Give us some examples about that. Sure, several things come to mind. There are some people who, before cancer uh, appeared on their horizon, they knew what they loved, and for some reason, the cancer experience, they, after the cancer experience, they feel disconnected from it. Might be for a while, at least, that they don't feel well, or afterwards, they, there may be overwhelm, or sometimes it goes to anxiety or depression. Things, things start to cloud the picture, and they feel disconnected from what they love, and what I want to remind people about, if, if that sounds familiar, is that you are not less than you were before the cancer. You're not less in any way. You may have a few new challenges to deal with, additional challenges, but whatever 
you know, your, your soul is the same soul that was there before, albeit having been through some new experiences. And if you loved something before, that love can still be there, and there's no reason you shouldn't engage in it. There's, nobody has to give you permission for that. Go for it if it calls to you at all. Or if something new calls to you, that's great too. But don't ever think that there's something, because of the cancer, there's something holding you back from what you truly love. You, you have permission mm. to do whatever you, you want. I love that. Yeah, yeah. That means because- allowing someone else to do my laundry. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I have a, yeah, I have a the other way too, whatever you didn't like. Yes. <laughs> I, I have a sign above my washing machine. It says, "When I said I do, I didn't mean laundry." <laughs> <laughs> and my husband's actually very good at doing the laundry. He helps all the time. But anyway, sorry, I digress. But you know, that's okay. Oh, no, that's okay. And and if it means rearranging your life, like laundry and other tasks, so so that you can do what you love, that's actually pretty important. Yeah. So I I, I would uh, align with that. Good. I'll tell him. Uh, for, that, for, for that busy busy yeah. mom that has to kind of. She feels like she has to just like add cancer to the mix. I mean, you know, her kids still need her, you know, Uh, if -hmm. she's working, she might be trying to continue to work. I mean, wow, that's Mm -hmm. I mean, it's hard, hard to stay in the light when when, you know, it feels like your your world is kind of falling apart or or getting so overwhelming that how, how do we do that? Well, in the example that you just gave, and of course that that can be overwhelming. You know, we we know that there are people who still have to work during this whole experience, may still have childcare uh, to take care of during this experience. It is hard. It's so hard. It's very, very, it very challenging. So we, we we of course acknowledge that. And in that case, the uh, one thing not to forget is to remember to celebrate everything that you do get done. Even the work, even the childcare, even the laundry, it, you're doing it because this is what's so important to you. And mm-hmm. so you're, you're, you're standing and living in your values, and there is huge, huge, uh, there's something great to celebrate about that. A person who lives in alignment with their values, with their vision for themselves, with what's important to them, that also is a foundation of wellness. And as challenging as it is, and of course, you're permitted to get help with all this, but but uh, you know, just the idea that you believe this is important, and if your family benefits, and if you benefit for knowing that, you know, things are held together that way, to celebrate that, that is part of being who you are, mm-hmm. is is, mm-hmm. is standing up for for what you can, you know, believe needs to take, be taken care of. And again, right. support is okay, you know, but 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 the fact that you're in line with your values, major, it's major. Oh. Yeah, yeah, of course. That makes complete sense. Mm-hmm. And again, you know, mm-hmm. I remember going through my cancer and I, I was able to stay off work during mine, um, which actually allowed me more time with my children. And and mm-hmm. even though I wasn't, you know, feeling real great most of the time, but but I was able to go to games that I wasn't able to normally when I'm a full-time working mom. So I cherished those moments and, and really um, tried to be there even more than I was normally because of the working full-time stuff. Yeah, that's fabulous. And again, you, you know, it's, it's a perfect example how you had limited resources, let's say energy, but you, what you, you use those precious resources to support what was most important to you. For example, exactly. your children and their mm-hmm. games, et cetera. Yeah. That's right. Very right. Right. About that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And again, you know, I know we talked a little bit about positive attitude on the last segment, but um, how, what's your, what's your f- feeling? How, how would you express that positive attitude thing and how do you get it <laughs> or keep it mm-hmm. or <laughs> Yeah. Well, I, I want to say first that having a positive attitude certainly does not mean not feeling uh, disappointment, not feeling anger, not feeling um, frustration, various emotions that we can feel certainly along this path. It's a, you know, that challenging a path, it's almost inevitable that we'll feel some of those emotions, and that's important to recognize that those are valid. Having said that, we don't want to get stuck there. We don't want to end up pitching our tent there because right. that is living in those fear hormones or those, those negative hormones that don't support our wellness. So mm-hmm. we may experience that, 
And what we want to do is see if we can move through and beyond that. If we talked we about that on... Caught, yeah. oh, yeah. Just real quick, we talked about that on one of our shows. We called it the, and a lot of people use this term, the pity party. And, you know, we all have mm-hmm. them from time to time. Mm-hmm. And the, the key is just don't stay at the party for too long. And that's really what you're what yeah. you're saying to us right now. Because, you know, it, it's okay to go. Just don't hang, <laughs> you know, not for too long. Exactly. So, yeah. Exactly. So, and so, you know, and so the next step, you know, you, yes, feel it, acknowledge it. And, and the next step is to do exactly what you said before, Becky, is to take a step in, in a different direction, one that you really want to take a direction. Again, even if it starts with a shower or a walk or something very simple, but actually those are very significant actions. And, mm-hmm. you know, Bob Proctor, who's one of the great teachers of self-awareness and success, um, Bob Proctor will walk around saying, you know what the, the, the answer is to depression? Do anything. Just do something. <laughs> because yeah. when we right. get stuck into depression, we, we're feeling hopeless. We feel like there's nothing we do makes any difference. And it's just the opposite. Everything we do mm-hmm. makes a difference. Mm-hmm. So Interesting. I, even if I love that. Something relatively mundane. Yeah. It's, it's, it's yeah. super important. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Remember that cobweb you that uh, yeah. that cobweb story, <laughs> Becky? Remember? Yeah. Tell, I do. tell that really, because I don't think we've talked about that. And yeah. If we have, it's been a very long time. Well, okay, so when I went through my first battle back in 1996, God, it seems like, oh, anyway, um, I had, I was kind of in that pity party state, and I was laying on my couch for, I don't know, probably days or weeks or something. Anyway, I was watching this cobweb grow in the corner of my dining room, and and it was kind of pretty, you know, every time the heater would kick on, it would kind of blow around a little bit, but it was there, (laughs) and I knew it needed to come down, but I just kind of watched it get bigger and bigger, and I just... I knew it needed to go, but I, again, I just sort of ignored it. And then one day my, my husband's cousin, Candace, dropped by and she had a bucket of cleaning supplies and she said, okay, I'm here to clean your house. You can take a nap or you can sit and visit, but whatever, I'm here to help. And she came in and I'm thinking, well, I can sleep when I'm dead, so I think I'll just sit and visit. And her energy around me, just watching her clean my counters and my, just, I mean, it was just this energy was kind of bowling me over almost. It was pretty awesome. So I, I went and got the broom and I knocked down that stupid cobweb and you would have thought that I just completed a marathon. I mean, it was, it made me smile and I thought, wow, that felt kind mm. of good. <laughs> you know? and the next it, thing it, I it's knew. Symbolic. It's symbolic yeah. though of, of kind of like you, like you said, Shani, doing something. Yeah. Well, and it got me mm-hmm. going. I mean, it got me when I, I knocked that thing down and then I went on a search for other ones that I'd missed over all this time. And I started knocking down cobwebs in a lot of places, you know, <laughs> but it, mm-hmm. it felt good to be doing something. And um, and it got me out of that that dark place. It's just a dumb little thing, but really, what got me out of it to begin with was her coming over. But um, but yeah, I had choices then. I could have just gone and taken a nap, but I didn't. And um, yeah, so those little things sometimes. So um, so yeah, I you know I think there's some really good messages here. And Shawnee, I know one of the things you talk about is staying authentic, and we only have about a minute or maybe a minute and a half. So can you speak on staying authentic? What what do you mean by that when you say that? Yeah, I often say that um, the most important thing is not to paste on positivity, it's to be authentic. The it, It's about listening, yes, to, to your emotions, but also to your soul underneath of them. So let the emotions come through, let them pass, uh, acknowledge them, it's okay. And then ask your inner voice what it really wants. Ask your inner self. Stay true to your inner self. You know, we we all have this little voice inside of us that will never lie to us. It never, ever lies. And if we get quiet and we hear what it wants and we follow its guidance, we find that we're walking toward the light. It will always guide us toward the light. So Mm -hmm. that, you know, you, you, um, you know, even even if it's just knocked down that cobweb today, you know, it, it looks funny, but it's, like you said, it opened up a whole field of, I can do this, I'm in action again, I feel normal again. You know, one tiny little thing, you know, that, that you then took action on, it, you know, it, it, these, these things lead us to back to the life that we want. So I think part of um, the great adventure uh, of uh, coming through this cancer experience and beyond it is learning to really get back in touch with ourselves. Who are we really? We have this opportunity to bring back to the fore the most um, authentic parts of ourselves. And when we do that, 
we find we are in the light. We, we're, we're the happiest when there's no tension between who we're really, how we're showing up and, and who we really want to be. Right. Uh, that's beautiful. Well, Shawnee, I hate to say it, but we're actually out of time. Um, this hour always goes by so quickly, and I just really appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule to give insight to our, our audience and to just kind of reaffirm in me that, you know, st- how important it is to stay in the light because I do have my pity moments, but um, but I try not to stay there too long as we talked about. So um, to our listeners, uh, one of her specialties is on overcoming fear of recurrence and how you get past that. We don't have time to talk more about it right now, but you can listen in depth if you go back to our uh, September, what day did we say that thing was? September something. Uh Um, Yeah, September 16th. You can go back, uh, 2016. You can go back and listen to it on demand in our archives. So please do that because it was a really powerful episode. And, you know, if you're one of those 70% who's having that fear of recurrence right now, go listen to it because out of that 70%, I don't know what percent will actually have a recurrence, but um, that, there's that saying that I, I stole from my flooring contractor, uh, <laughs> don't put demons where none exist. And I love that quote. He gave it to He said I could use it. So, <laughs> But anyway, it's a great quote, and we tend to do that. So, so thank you, Dr. Shawnee, for being on our episode today. We want to remind our listeners to please, if you like this show, we are donor-supported. So please go online to breastfriends.org, hit the big blue button at the top of the page, and make a donation so we can keep this show on the air in 2019. So we will be back next week. Until then, remember, there's always hope, and we're here to help you find it. 